Welcome. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday morning. Uh, first, uh, thank you to Creative Mornings, to St. Kate, to Moa, Paul, Nick on AV, all of you for being here. Uh, Amelia, who asked me to speak today. Uh, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, all right. OK. So most of you recognized that that was a rhetorical question. Uh, a plus on your reading of interpersonal uh, performance speaker audience relations. Let's try another one. This one is not rhetorical. Please raise your hand, show of hands. Those of you watching on the interwebs, please also raise your hands. If you own or have ever used a phone, show of hands. Yes, yes, that is as I suspected. That's pretty much all of you. And those of you who are not raising your hands, I would venture to guess, are just not feeling like raising your hands. <laughs> Please play along, though, even on the tubing nets. I've got a lot of dad jokes, and it's more fun if you uh, play along. OK, now, uh, raise your hand uh, if you have or have ever used a computer. Yes. Also, pretty much everyone. Cool, you can put your hands in. OK. Now. Uh, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and, <laughs> and with your eyes closed in your head, picture the first such device, phone or computer, that you remember using or owning. You got it? That one's rhetorical. Now take that device and try to imagine, try to image, to visualize where this machine is or could be right now. It's a bit harder, right? Where is it? OK, you can open your eyes. Uh, so I wondered this precise question about three or so years ago, and I took it a step further still. I wondered, I asked, where will our phones and computers be in 100 years, in 1,000 years, in a million years? What will they look like? What will happen to them? What stories might they tell about us, about the environment they're a part of about themselves? Because we don't think of our phones or computers as so much garbage. Well, I mean, some we do, and I'm not naming any brands. But we don't think of them as waste. How will our devices weather or grow over time? What else might our electronic waste be? And how might we sense and feel this? Where could computer media lead our environmental and economic politics? Can we plan and act toward new and different possibilities and potentials? And in this, might we image, that is, use aesthetics to open possibilities toward more sustainable technological futures? So I started imaging techno-aesthetic futures by literally weathering devices. I tested out different methods of artificially aging and otherwise transforming electronic waste for fossils with a PH. Get it? Fossilized phones? Yeah. This one's called burner phone. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. For fossils, I subject media devices to extreme heat and cold artificial pressure in geological time or otherwise intense conditions that weather and turn these materials into something else. These are synthetic archives and simulated relics for a future time. Cook, freeze, burn, smash, blend, and more, and put the results on exhibits, in beakers and tubes, on pedestals and stands as archaeological finds and or photographic images. I've heard, that was my first phone. And God, I hated how that one hated, uh, felt on my face or had people ask, have you tried stomach acid? Yes, yes, I have. Uh, a ceramics killed? Uh-huh. And I even went kinetic with my live water fountain that cracks and peels the glass off of a different iPhone over the course of each exhibition, and a regularly flipping hourglass that similarly sands down a split smartphone each exhibition. There's a kind of like seriously playful and playfully serious intervention into the emotional and utilitarian relationships we have with our digital devices when we think of them as not only ways of working or connecting, but also as our personal garbage, as an artifact, as a raw material, as clay or slime or so much plastic and solder and toxins, as pieces of time, of a time, as eventually old and degrading and problematic, rather than new and exciting or needing replacement for that matter. This is matter that matters. On an intimate level, it has us look again at our waste. And systemically, it asks, 
<clears throat> dramatic pause, or maybe I just misplaced the paper. Where and how might aesthetic encounters with and around science and technology, computers and waste, life and matter, create new theories and goals, new experiments and projects, new research, new disciplines, and more? So as I progressed with fossils, I wanted to aesthetically beget so much, but I, I, I wanted to use computers to explore race. Turn them into modes of transport. I have an awesome slow-mo video of one of my studio assistants landing a, almost landing a kickflip on this one. Uh, turn a computer into charcoal, or a mouse into charcoal. And I didn't stop with what I could accomplish in my studio. I reached out to other researchers, to engineers and scientists who were experimenting around climate change, alternative fuels, compostable plastics, and more. This led me to a collaboration with Dr. Johannes Lehmann, a professor of biogeochemistry and soil fertility management. So Johannes specializes in pyrolysis. Basically, he repurposes biological waste, like restaurant leftovers or manure, slowly heating them in the absence of oxygen. And in doing so, he sequesters carbon dioxide from being released and warming the globe. And then instead of throwing out that waste in a landfill, for example, he uses these biochars uh, to help with minerals in farming. So this is like a triple win in terms of climate change. And it was super interesting for me to see how similarly his lab and my studio worked around hypotheses, sampling, and testing. Here, for example, we charred compact discs, CDs, playing with different temperatures, different rates of heating up, different amounts of cooking time. A piece of an audio cassette tape, of which I have many. <laughs> Hashtag aging myself. <laughs> a keyboard key from an old Dell. Remnants of a floppy disk's plastic casing some of those old manually punched cards that acted as binary code for early computers with their carbon mostly sequestered. Uh, I actually joined Johannes and dozens of his peers for a conference around their work and climate change, then followed up with several days of my own experiments with his pyrolysis equipment, super fun. Uh, an old hard drive, clear function shown here, left just the right melted keys visible, a charred QWERTY keyboard to go with my previously shown mouse. A melted phone bending over backwards for me with the title Soil Science, more than a nod to Johannes's work. Uh, an entire stack. Oh, sorry, no, this is a, an old uh, disc, and you can almost make out where it says Hewlett Packard in the corner, an old floppy disc, and then here's an entire stack of melted floppies. So here, pyrolysis became an art practice, and my art practice scientifically worked toward sustainable alternatives to human-made waste. And yes, we're still working together on new projects, both artistic and scientific. Hauntingly poetic, intense, yet hopeful, sad, and beautiful, all consuming around our consumption. This is what I hope for. But it's, to be clear, not meant to only inspire individual devotion. Individual, individual action is simply not enough anymore. There are some unnerving figures to talk about this. For example, in 2018 alone, more than one and a half billion mobile phones were sold worldwide. That's an average of more than 4 million phones per day, and doesn't include the produced but unsold phones that will eventually also become waste. Try to picture 4 million mobile phones. That's one day. It's terrifying. We're still the e-waste we throw away is nothing compared to the damage we do by digging up the raw materials to create and then produce that hardware in the first place. I hadn't known that last fact when I started my project, and it utterly floored me when I first encountered it. Such information and data are in two words, unfathomable and depressing. Unfathomable in that I can't connect to them personally, like the difference between being a millionaire and a billionaire, it's huge, but not part of my inference capabilities. And depressing precisely in that inability to know or implicit in that lack of knowledge act. Amelia who uh, invited me to do this talk, said she thinks the Creative Morning's theme of roots is not only symbolic of stability, but a cycle of renewal. Roots are literally a filtration system for the soil, a new beginning. I wanted to talk around roots for three reasons. The first is that digging up of raw materials I mentioned. We don't know what we do when we dig up. We don't know what we uproot and, that, and then dump, and their long-term impacts the second is more metaphorical and asks, can we reroute, pun intended, obviously you've met me, 
also reroute, and find new paths for caring. And the third is literal. Next in this body of work for the show, I planted and supplanted new roots through seeds of care. That's the provocation you had earlier. And as I imaged more techno-aesthetic futures, I moved into spaces of non-human life. Server farms, but um cha <laughs> see computers and other technological equipment repurposed as planters. The sculptures and photographs take cues from journalist Alan Wiseman's provocative book, The World Without Us, which inspired the title of my exhibition and this talk. Wiseman wonders how quickly non-human life would retake the planet if humans were to suddenly disappear, and found that the answer is not very long. He begins with stories of plant life retaking cities, whereas I physically manifest botanically occupied electronic waste alongside an as experimentation and exploration. Apple grass, a gutted iMac, where screen and motherboard are replaced with lawn. Farm in the Dell. Wait for it. Allo world for you coders. Fangirls. Molds and fungi in and around speakers and rotaries. A phony plant, hashtag I went there. I let each of these flower, flourish, incubate, and spread. What life may spur, how might techno minerals diffuse? This photographic print, sporadical, hashtag yet one more dad pun, presents a five foot wide mushroom with moss bursting from an Apple Watch. I also show it at other sizes and from different angles, but that oversized water droplet has just broken free from the fungus fruits gilled and spore producing underside. It serves to kind of uh, amplify the scaled upness of this particular work. There's that printed on plastic, circuit board in and among the flowerless plants and dirt, and all of this sits in that familiar res gold, rose gold, shiny pink bucket with holes for speakers and microphones and spongy arms on either side. This image, at least for me, doesn't merely stage or depict or represent. The photograph itself does things. It resituates life and technology, earth time, human time, and technological time together. It speculates on how life may incubate and grow behind, beyond our and nature's imaginings. It wonders what will digital media be and do in and with the world after us, and it proposes a cybernatural future that is neither apocalyptic nor utopian, but at the very least a possible commingling of the supposedly conflicting categories of non-human biology and human engineering. It asks us to rethink life and living, science and sensation, waste and production, perception and action. Yes, this piece and the show Resituates, speculates, wonders, and proposes, and it asks us to do the same. Resituate, speculate, wonder, and propose. Soapbox, that is what art and aesthetics more generally do. Aesthetics around art, text, politics, or the everyday are a style of looking and showing and telling with as argument. Style orients us toward new possibilities. Obviously, someone who wears this jacket thinks style is very important. <laughs> and in this, art is both an action and a call to action. And this work, as I worked with it, had me continuously resituating, speculating, wondering, and proposing, what if, for example, what if it isn't only the plants that will thrive and grow after us? What if electronic waste, too, were to replicate and multiply, incubate and spread? What could that look and feel like? What would an installation like this do? What I call the wall after us <clears throat> is my work that attempts to bridge from the unfathomable and depressing to an individual understanding and responsibility on a larger scale. It can take between 250 and up to 1,000 square feet of wall space at a given exhibition. Laptops, keyboards, tapes, drives, phones, circuits, and other degraded electronic waste intermingled with cables and plants all clinging to and climbing up the walls to create an overwhelming and affective sense of what we use and throw out, what it might grow into, and how the earth may or may not claim it. Multiple towers of e-waste, each between 8 and 12 feet tall, also come off the walls out and into the viewer's space, implicating them, their media, and their bodies in the ecologies at play, in and around humans, nature, and politics, waste, media, and utility. It's intimate. That yellow phone was in my kitchen growing up. <laughs> and systemic. 
once people heard about this body of work, the flood of hopeful donations from those who wanted to somehow put their garbage to good use overwhelmed me. So finally, I also asked, can we reinvent what digital waste might be and do right now? How else might we reroute in the present? So my, my utilities see electronic waste rethought as a raw material and transmuted into other usable forms. In phony prints, hashtag, oh, they just keep coming. Mobile phones are ground into a fine powder and a blender and mixed with extender to turn them into ink for fine art prints of phones on paper made of my old t-shirts. You can see the details of plastic, metal, and cardboard from the ground circuit boards on this rotary phone. Sense the grime of and in this razor. Laugh, but also wonder at my faux mm, ink. Faux, faux mm, ink, yeah, grown, OK. <laughs> Applications see melted aluminum iMacs from the late 2000s recast into a hammer, screwdriver, and wrench. These are too soft to actually be put to use, but they certainly beg the question, what else? And circuitous tools are CNC routed circuit boards turned into a saw, axe, and trowel. These all ask viewers to be curious and imagine to test, play, and transform. <laughs> The world after us as a body of work will continue to grow as I hopefully travel the exhibition with more art coming out of various studios and labs. Taken together, it questions how we move, think, feel, and act with the earth and its inhabitants, both living and otherwise. It's political, but it speaks across political lines. It's completely physical, but it asks us to think virtually about the potentials our futures hold. It's multimedia, networked, and participatory, but not in the ways so often hyped up in and around new technologies at stake. Whether in our everyday interactions or on a much larger scale are the relationships between humans and the natural world on the one hand, between politics and commerce on the other. As I was getting ready for the premiere of The World After Us right here in St. Kate, Milwaukee, MOA, DTN, I began to see piles of my own useless electronics. The stuff I couldn't turn into art for whatever reason. Too hard to crush or blend or turn into ink. Too many capacitors to cut around. Too hard to drill, drill, drill through. You've all been there. Uh, so my studio is throwing things away again. But we want to do it differently. We now have an intimate knowledge of the local means for handling electronic waste, as well as an understanding of the systems that govern them. I encourage you all here or on the interwebs to do research on the e-waste opportunities local to you. Possibilities that range from things like, for example, UW-Milwaukee's Office of Sustainability and their surplus office, who reuse, resell, and or strip for materials and parts. Okay, remember way back around 18 minutes ago, that first phone or computer I had you imagine? How many have you owned since then? What if you kept each one just one extra year? Over a lifetime, how much money would that save you? How much waste? What could you do with what you save? Where might that money or electronics go? You could also look into NGOs like Digital Bridge, also here, who partner with other nonprofits and NGOs to provide technology to low-income households and set up labs for communities in need. That's here, like I said, in Milwaukee, but there are spaces like this all over the world. Batteries in Florida, Florida excuse me, and Free Geek in Portland are two that reached out to me after they read about my opening online, and I'm looking into working with at least one of them soon. Just as importantly, we all need to engage with the systems of care, the systems of care in a global context. Did you know that it is illegal to export most e-wastes for reuse, repair, and elective upgrade? It happens anyway. So why not legally facilitate ethical and useful trade? And, and why not regulate electronic manufacturers' mining, production, and recycling practices? The same way the FDA regulates food and drugs. We pay such close attention to what we put into our bodies. Why wouldn't we do the same for what we output to our habitats? Regulate our waste. Restrict planned obsolescence. Reduce the toxic environments these all create in both senses of the phrase toxic environment. Can we offset both carbon and waste in this way? 
tax polluters and use that money for cleanup jobs, lobby in our municipalities and local governments for those moss trees that guzzle up CO2 and pollution. Ask Elon Musk to figure out how to drill baby drill off world, save things here and dig on Mars rather than moving there. It sounds crazy, but so did many of the things we now use and do on a daily basis. Just look in your pocket. Aesthetic action begets aesthetic action. By this I mean that imaging and imagining aesthetics can make and provoke the production of new futures, of more imaging and imagining, and back and forth and again, actions and calls to action. This is and has been my project throughout my more than 20 year career as an artist, writer, speaker, and teacher. And there's one thing more. Change our intimate relationships with technology and waste. Change the systems of care around them. And I also hope to inspire things that I cannot yet predict. Yes, recycle better, but we must also seek out questions, scientific experiments, aesthetic explorations, and political figurings together, since they are always already entangled. Rethink our geological futures through the communion of media and nature. Tend to and care for our world, both for and after us. Reroute, supplant. We can do better. We have to do better. Resituate, speculate, wonder, and propose. This is absolutely not rhetorical. It is art and aesthetics, it is an action, and it is a call to action. Will you join me? Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, yeah. One more round of applause for Nathaniel Stern. We're going to jump into a, a little Q&A here. We have a few minutes. Um, so we'll get the questions rolling. And just for the uh, sake of our friends on the internet, um, we'll just use the mic so everybody can around the world here. Who wants to kick us off? One over here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have a short comment and a question. So the comment is, you're focused on the artifact of the phone, but there's actually more to it. Because it's not even just the battery, the battery has to plug in. So if you're looking at the whole thing of what you're mining, it goes back to fossil fuels, if you're lucky, green energy. So there's actually, it's a bigger equation. But the second thing, there's a book, I was so excited to see your work with Johannes Lehmann. He's just so cool. Agree. Um, there is a new book that Albert Bates and Kathleen Draper came up with that you've probably read called Burn. I met them at this conference. They you, were there. You are so lucky. <laughs> um, anyway, one of the things that they point out in their book, which is curiously optimistic, is the idea of biochars plural. So not just going back into the soil, but going into anything from water filters to um, you know, bricks and asphalt and whatever. Are you planning to extend what you're doing to that? Yeah, good question, and absolutely. So um, Johannes and I are continuing our collaboration, and although it didn't make it into the show, um, I do have pictures and examples and, and fun times in and around some of the bricks that they made. Um, they've made new forms of uh, compostable plastics that actually have some of the biochar in it. So they have like uh, coffee mug tops, the, the plastic coffee mug tops that we often use, not mug, but coffee cup tops. Um, and certainly that's, that's in and around the provocations that I, that I want to get to. Um, I think that so many of us are aware that this is a problem, but we're not, as you just pointed out with your comment, aware just how big it is. And it can feel so overwhelming in terms of what can I do? Um, I think a friend of mine recently called it compassion fatigue. <laughs> There's just so much to do that like late stage capitalism is so bad for everything. <laughs> And so it's these kinds of conversations that I, and dialogues around the intimate and systemic, I'm, I mean, I meant what I said, um, engagements as well as that inspirational space. And so Johannes and, and Kathleen have inspired me greatly. Uh, and I do hope to continue uh, collaborating in and around you know, creative solutions, creative possibilities and inspiration. Um, Johannes is actually coming on February 15th here uh, we're flying him out and two of the other catalog SAS to do a panel here at the St. Kate and in the Ark so you're all invited to come join uh, and then I'm also started I started work with an experimental physicist and a geographer on more extreme conditions so playing with uh, zero degree Kelvin and very high electromagnetic fields to see what we can do with this 
Yeah, I think the political figurings around the raw earth minerals are a really important thing too, right? So most of our lithium, a lot of our lithium comes from the Congo, which has like the largest slave trade in history, for example. Um, there's, there's, it's really terrifying. Thank you for your comment and your question. Okay, um, I was just wondering what you think the role of art plays in the political change. Um, it seems like that's a very interesting topic to you, so I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, uh, that's a great question, a huge, huge question. Um, and I think it, it depends on the individual artist, to be sure. Um, some, some artists um, stage political acts explicitly. Uh, I think a really fantastic example of that is right here in Milwaukee, the Overpass Light Brigade are an amazing group of activist organizers who take political messages and have each letter held up by an individual. So you'll have to have a group of around 20 people, each holding one alphanumeric character to say question austerity, for example, on an overpass. Uh, and so they've formed communities and groups worldwide. Uh, the brigadiers have many uh, chapters worldwide. Others try to do it more implicitly that rather than explicitly. For me, um, part of what my last book was about is uh, using aesthetics as a place to have ethical conversations that bridge political divides. It's so, we are so divisive at this point in our country where asking someone's political party immediately changes your opinion of anything they say. When the truth is, the vast majority of Americans agree on things like raising the minimum wage. Even the very few who don't believe in climate change understand that waste is a problem. All of us want to overturn Citizens United. Heck, even 80% of Americans want witnesses in the impeachment trial. <laughs> and so um, for me, being able to have conversations where we talk about making more beauty in the world is a heck of a lot easier than starting from that space. And that's where art is activism. And, and that's where I try to live. Uh, I don't want to devalue any other art forms. I think already being creative is in some ways and can be a political act, and each of us chooses our path within that space. Um, I'm curious about, hi, it's wonderful to see you. Nice to see you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Reunion. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm curious about things like Marie Kondo's life-changing magic of tidying up, and she has a lot of great ideas about living with less but also that has created a whole lot of waste. Yeah. And what are your thoughts around living with less and also like, you know, some of the ways that that creates waste and can be complicated? It's so hard. Um, and, and I think, I'm gonna quote Lisa Moline here and I actually already have. So she's one of the co-founders of the Overpass Light Brigade. And she's, I, I've always heard her say like, you know, the Overpass Light Brigade, they're amazing, right? They do all this action and then you ask, it's like, wait a second, the batteries you use are bad for the environment, the LEDs you make are bad for the environment, the wood you're using does, and she's like, you can't do anything that isn't bad on some level. And so you have to find a balance because late stage capitalism is just bad for everything. So on the one hand, you have to make a balance in your individual decisions. For example, um, this blazer, it's fast fashion. Oh my God, it's so bad, <laughs> right? But, but I will keep it and wear it for much longer than most fast fashion allows. And when it breaks, I will mend it. <laughs> um, uh, and so this is where I think that engagement needs to be both that intimate, like make those conscious choices. My, in fact, provocation around like keep your phones longer comes from Hassan Minaj's Patriot Act on fast fashion, his episode on fast fashion, where he says, keep your fast fashion longer. Right, so we're all, influ I love him, he's so cute. Um, <laughs> my wife and I totally have a crush on Hassan Minaj, if you're, if you're out there. Um, and then the other is the systemic thing, like this is so important. Um, we cannot do this alone, we have to change policy. We have to take our democracy back from corporations. We have to do this, this is the most important thing we can do. I mean, the two people, and I'll mention this, uh, the two people who have been most influential on me here for this show are uh, Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything, where she says this is a capitalism problem more than anything else. And if you're interested in understanding the kind of raw materials and waste and things like that, Josh Lepowski's Reassembling Rubbish. 
um, just blew my mind and terrified me. <laughs> Thank you. I actually had a, a similar question, but I guess it's because we're friends. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I come from a long line of hoarders, and when you <laughs> asked me where my uh, first computer is, you know, I know, <laughs> 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 and it can still be turned on, exactly. but. Um, I'm just curious because I did have an agenda coming here today partially to let you know about a large horde. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I heard you say that like you had too many people um, trying to inflict their hordes on you. <laughs> and I <laughs> was curious like what some of your experiences are because I'm deeply interested in the neurosis and also um, inherent like virtue of hoarding, but also the the fact that like you had on the first slide, like it's beyond what we can do at this point, and hoarders don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm curious, like, what are some personal experiences with hordes that, or or even just philosophical, if you can't provide personal experiences. <laughs> Dad, are you watching? <laughs> Did my wife manage to give you enough tech support that you're on Facebook now? <laughs> um, yeah. I almost want to say I got nothing. Um, I think, uh, but what I will share, and this is an interesting, so I'm going to kind of pivot a little bit, because one question that I often get asked is, like, am I contributing to the problem? Especially because, as I've learned over time, and I said in my talk, there's certain art I can, there's certain pieces that I've learned I can use aesthetically, and others I can't. So, for example, the newer phones are the easiest to blend. For those of you who want to know, like, uh, if you if you ever want to put an iPhone in a Vitamix, it's got to be the fi iPhone five or, or later. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> um, but what's been interesting is uh, when we started, we were like going, and some of my studio assistants are here, Sam, the amazing Sam Tan, um, who was my studio uh, manager for the three years of this project. Um, we used to like, st we started off like going to shops like Goodwill and used shops and then event like I posted to Facebook and like then we started getting these things. And one of the places that we've been working with extensively now is UWM's Office of Surplus. Um, Kate Nelson runs the Office of Sustainability. Andrew Avery Johnson runs the Surplus Office. And what we get asked a lot is like, aren't you, like are you wasting this stuff and what are you doing? So what's been really fun is working out a way to not do that. And I wonder if we can have those relationships with our hordes and waste. So for example, what the UWM Office of Surplus does is they get decommissioned computers from faculty and staff that they're not using anymore. And the first thing they do is, okay, can this be used anywhere else? Can this be lent out at the library? Is there someone who doesn't need as powerful of a computer? The next thing they do is they try to sell it online. And then when they can't do that, the last thing they do is they literally strip it down for parts. They safely make sure that the batteries and the hard drives are clear and they recycle those. They actually have huge bins of like copper versus aluminum. That's where we got the aluminum IMAX that we melted down and then they sell it off. So I intervene right there in between no one is going to use this computer and we're going to strip it for parts and that's where I get stuff and then I ha we have a deal where I don't own any of this. I have to give it back to him. So anything even on this show, like in hopefully the show will travel and see a few years of life, but anything then goes back to him. <laughs> um, and I've also, he doesn't know this yet, Andrew, if you're watching, you will learn this. Um, if anything sells, all I have to do is pay him for those pieces, but my plan is to donate more than that to the Office of Surplus to make sure that he can continue his important work. One more round of applause for Nathaniel Stern. Thank you, everybody.